I'm a clinical professor of medicine at the NYU uh, School of Medicine and the director of palliative care since 2002. I've also been a member of the ethics committee uh, since uh, 1999 and was chair for three and a half years. Um, and I am looking forward to uh, giving this talk again. And I welcome any questions. If it's burning, uh, Lacey can interrupt me. Um, otherwise, I'll leave some time at the end and we'll have two short breaks. This is uh, uh, the case of an 83 or 85 year old male with metastatic lung cancer and renal failure. He's been on a ventilator for three weeks. He's unable to speak for himself, but his daughter is certain he would always want, quote, everything done to extend his life. Except that his wife had a severe respiratory illness requiring a tracheostomy, which is a hole in the neck, and that and she died shortly thereafter. So he said that he would never want a tracheostomy. And you should know that normally we do a tracheostomy after seven, eight days or so because long-term intubation or tube that goes directly into the trachea uh, can lead to vocal cord issues as well as stenosis of the trachea. Now the daughter refused a tracheostomy because her father stated he would never want one. Out of care was consulted on the case and recommended setting other limits, which the daughter refused and suggested an ethics consultation. Although I should say that we in palliative care have training in ethics and we uh, normally do the ethics consultations or we, because of the work we do, speaking to the ethical issues with both teams and with families, uh, we can also often help resolve ethical issues without uh, calling on the ethics consultant. And in fact, in Brooklyn, which is also an NYU hospital, the ethics consults went down by 75% when palliative care became a presence in the hospital. Um, so uh, this is a quote by uh, Dr. Cassell, who's right down the hall, Eric Cassell, or up the street, I should say, the relief of suffering and the cure of disease must be seen as twin obligations of a medical profession that is truly dedicated to the care of the sick. Physicians' failure to understand the nature of suffering can result in medical intervention that though technically adequate, not only fails to relieve suffering, but becomes a source of suffering itself. And so it's important for us to take a, a truly holistic view of the patient and not just their disease. So some of our objectives now are to describe how and where we are dying in the US and I will get into uh, worldwide issues as well. Define palliative care, practice setting goals of care, discuss systems in which palliative care is delivered, Describe typical ethical issues in palliative care. Define hospice and when a patient is appropriate for hospice referral. Compare and contrast advanced care planning documents and start thinking about selected legal issues. This is a chart that shows the diseases from which Americans die. You can see the heart disease and cancer are by far the two leading causes of death, somewhere around 30% both, so that leaves uh, around 40% of deaths to unintentional injuries, COPD, chronic lower respiratory illnesses, stroke. Alzheimer's disease, by the way, is increasing in uh, frequency and rate. Uh, diabetes, influenza, and pneumonia, kidney disease, and suicide. My mother, in fact, has Alzheimer's dementia, and now has lost the ability to speak, although she's still walking and she requires 24 seven care. These are symptoms at the end of life. Uh, it's Pretty well recognized and understood that pain is very common in cancer, but it also is common in non-cancer, non-malignant diseases, 67%. Trouble breathing occurs in about half of all patients. Nausea and vomiting more common in cancer, but still pretty prevalent in non-cancer patients. Sleeplessness or insomnia. Confusion, very common, a little more than a third of the patients. Depression, likewise, very common between 35 and 40%. Loss of appetite, more common in cancer, but still 38% of non-malignant diseases, constipation, bed sores, and incontinence. So these are the most common symptoms towards the end of life. In the United States, the median age of death is around 77 years. Among survivors, if you, if you reach the age of 65, then the median age of death is 84 for women and 80 for men, and that is increasing by decade. So what this means is that we become more frail over time as we prolong life, whether it's from heart disease or from cancer, so that we become more frail and thus we often have a progressive functional decline. 
and a loss of organ reserve accompanied by specific disease processes. This can very often lead to a death that is that has more suffering than, for example, a rapid death that might have occurred more commonly in the 1800s when someone got pneumonia and died. And pneumonia back then was called the old man's best friend. This is life expectancy in the United States. Uh, you can see that the median age went from the 60s back in 1950 up to the 77, and women live longer than men by a few years. This is the site of death, and you can see that there's been a significant paradigm shift in that 1993, 56% of patients died in the hospital. In 2017, 30% of patients died in the hospital, and met, which means that many more patients are dying at home on hospice, which I will get into in a few minutes. So what is palliative care? It is specialized medical care for patients with serious illness. It is focused on providing patients with relief of symptoms, pain, and stress of a serious illness, whatever the diagnosis. The goal is to improve quality of life for both the patients and their families. Now, this has had an impact on palliative care. The evolving medical technology, which has prolonged life, but also might prolong death. We have a very polarized and scrutinized political and medical legal environment in the United States. I'm sure that's the case in many other countries as well. Uh, we have longer survival with increased burden of disease and or functional impairment, which puts, which puts a significant financial stress on society. How do you manage? Uh, in, in the United States, many immigrant families, for example, are very centralized and, and families remain near each other. Children remain near their parents. Um, as people have become more Americanized, it's more common for children to move away to different cities, uh, which puts a, a significant burden on society. And now patients are alone, possibly without dying in the homes of their children, which is more common with immigrant families and in other countries. So uh, the other factors impacting part of care include culture, religious, ethnic, economic, educational, and other diversity. Now, when we apply to ethics to, in a, to a clinical setting, uh, many issues come up. One is the issue of truth telling. Are you obliged to tell the patient the truth? How do you know how much truth to tell? I mean, the answer to that, the short answer is you need to find out who that human being is, who that individual is, and what they can handle, what they don't, can't, and what they want to get, and what they would want, for example, maybe a more educated family member to get. Uh, in terms of medical decision making, we have issues with advanced directives, surrogate decision makers, so that when a patient has the opportunity, we should never let the window close on a patient who has the capacity to appoint the healthcare agent they trust to make decisions that are in keeping with their values. If they don't appoint someone, then we're left with surrogate decision makers. And I'll give you the list in a few minutes. Uh, another ethical principle is, is what is in the best interest of a patient, and that can be very subjective. So for any intervention or treatment, whether it's chemotherapy or surgery, we need to be aware of and communicate to the patient and or family what the risks and benefits and alternatives are, what the realistic goals of care are, what the level of suffering that might be expected. Suffering, the meaning of suffering is very different to different patients. One patient might be more likely to want to be more awake and have less pain. And another patient may tell us, I, I don't want any pain, just knock me out. So those two patients with the same disease and the same level of pain will get two totally different treatments. The quality of life that a patient would find acceptable. One patient would, will tell me that he or she would rather be dead than live in a nursing home. And another patient would be perfectly happy being on life support in a vegetative state. There are issues of futility or non-beneficial care we'll get into and also there are conflicts of value among members of a family or between family and medical providers or even between medical providers. Prognosis can be difficult. Now patients often make decisions that might be based upon their prognosis. They can't make those decisions unless they find out what that prognosis is. The red curve is a typical CHF patient, heart failure patient, who might get worse, be hospitalized, get better, get worse, get better, get worse, get better, then die with the next hospitalization. And it could be very difficult to predict which hospitalization that will be. Cancer, on the other hand, a cancer patients, it, it's much easier to predict prognosis. 
or in functional status declines and a patient is less able to do things on their own, more dependent, unless it happened dramatically because of an acute infection. But if this is the trajectory, then you know that cancer patient will die within weeks to months. So on the left is chemotherapy. You can see there's a transition point. And most of the public is pretty aware that when a cancer patient starts failing, losing weight, can't walk, that patient's gonna die. Uh, on the heart failure side, you can see that these exacerbations might happen. And so the patient family and the public are more like, are less aware of a trajectory like this that might lead to death, but it also is related to function. You can see that with every exacerbation on this curve, the patient doesn't quite reach the functional level that he or she was at prior to that exacerbation. So in palliative care, our goal is to restore the balance. Life prolonging care is fine if it's in keeping with the patient's values. So we need to find out what those values are, but death prolonging care suits nobody very well. And when, when can you define that? And that will depend on both the MD or the nurse practitioner and or the patient family. So the on top is the old paradigm where you had life prolonging care and then you know with hours or days to live, very often too late, you found out that the patient was gonna die and you drop off. Whereas palliative care, you can see in the light green on the bottom curve should be introduced to anyone or everyone who has life uh, limiting disease. And so as that disease gets worse, as the functional level gets worse, you palliative care takes on more and more of the workload and burden of caring for the patient because chemotherapy or advanced uh, cardiac therapeutics like using intravenous drips to improve heart function called inotropes or LVADs, left ventricular assist devices or uh, even transplants, which NYU is the number one heart transplant program in the country, are no longer options for the patient. And then if you have the patient admitted to hospice care, the longer the patient is in care, one or two months, is, is much better for the patient and family rather than transferring the patient to home hospice with only days to live. And hospices also provide bereavement care for 13 months after the patient dies to the family. This is a, a seminal paper that came out in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine. 151 patients were randomized to receive palliative care uh, or not. So patients with stage four lung cancer uh, were randomized to continue using the oncologist in the Massachusetts General uh, Clinic, or they saw that same oncologist and, and had a palliative care consult and continued to see the palliative care provider at least monthly thereafter. The patients who received palliative care had improved quality of life and mood, and mood, and they actually lived three months longer than the patients who didn't get palliative care, despite the fact that they had less aggressive end of life care, meaning they were in the hospital less often, they got intubated less often, they were in the intensive care unit less often, and they didn't get chemotherapy the last few weeks of their lives when their functional level was going down and when chemotherapy was more likely to hurt them than help them. So palliative care not only improved quality of life in this particular article in stage four cancer patients, it actually prolonged life. Now, what are some potential goals of care? If I ask a patient what their goal is, they may come up with any one of these. I want to be cured. Well, what if a patient gives you that as their goal, but uh, they have an incurable disease? Avoiding a premature death certainly is something that everyone would want. Maintaining or improving function should be a goal of most patients and is a goal of most patients, although they may not think of it that way. They just might, might want to live longer. And, and it, even if that means they've lost function and become more dependent, although most people I meet are not like that. Some people want to prolong their lives no matter what. Most patients certainly would want relief of suffering, but as I mentioned, some patients would prefer to be more awake and, and receive fewer medications that may impact their level of alertness or ability to interact with their loved ones. Quality of life is very subjective. Staying control, I've met a number of patients who have said that. Uh, a good death, again, very subjective. And then support for families and loved ones. So patients, if you ask them, what is your goal? You may find them giving you one, two, or three of these. Depending upon their course, the information they receive about prognosis and the trajectory of their disease, 
some goals may take priority over others. So very commonly, there will be a shift in the focus of care where initially you're being very aggressive and you back off and focus on being as more time with the family and being at home. And the shift in focus may be dramatic with the hospitalization or maybe gradual. It is an expected part of the continuum of medical care. So it is important for the primary doctors and the palliative care providers, if they're involved, to review goals with any change in health or functional status, the setting of care, for example, being hospitalized or going to a, a facility like a subacute rehab facility, or when there's a treatment preference point. So palliative care focuses on relieving suffering and improving quality of life. We in the palliative care realm affirm life. We see death as a personal and natural process. It's appropriate to introduce palliative care early in the course of disease. It doesn't mean we don't aggressively treat patients when appropriate. Patient and family preferences are respected, but you can only respect those preferences if you elicit those preferences and ask the patient and family what their values and preferences are. Palliative care may be combined with curative therapies or may be the focus of care alone. It is interdisciplinary. So we have chaplains, social workers as part of our team. We are experts in pain and symptom management. For example, in my hospital in Wayne Langone, all the cancer pain is treated by palliative care. We may include disease modifying treatments. We provide psychological, social, and spiritual support and bereavement support as well. Palliative care it can be hospital-based. So our team is hospital-based, but we also have palliative care clinics. And in fact, we have three palliative care providers in our cancer clinic. Um, so it may be hospital-based, primary, it may be consultative. Uh, we could have a unit potentially in a hospital, although we have a scatter bed a hospice program at NYU. It might be provided in a skilled nursing facility or nursing home. Hospice, on the other hand, is mostly at home and is provided by agencies uh, which are licensed by the, our government. So Medicare licenses hospice agencies, which means they have to provide certain services to qualify. It can be inpatient hospice um, uh, or it can be in a hospital. So what is hospice? In the United States, it is a reimbursement benefit for patients who have a limited prognosis or life expectancy of less than six months given the natural history of the disease. It is primarily community-based so a patient or family would get a, a home health aid, maybe two or three hours a day, Monday through Friday, under or song called 24-7, social workers and chaplains who come to the home. They provide equipment, oxygen, uh, a railing in the bathroom, a commode to go to the bathroom right next to the bed if necessary. Care is for terminally ill patients and their families. It's a team of professionals and trained volunteers. And hospice is started when the focus is on care and there is no longer a curable illness. And the goals are, are to relieve pain and other symptoms and provide psychosocial support. Hospice care provides patient control over decisions, family involvement, specialized services. They have to provide all of the medications related to the terminal illness, pastoral support, grief counseling, volunteer support, and then the option for the patient to die at home. And I have visited many patients at home who died at home with hospice provided at home. So conditions for hospice eligibility, I have really gone over for the most part. And as I mentioned, the patient's choosing palliation as a goal or relief of symptoms, and you need a Medicare certified hospice program. And a hospice program can lose its license if it doesn't provide all of the care I mentioned. Now, a patient or family can decide at some point they no longer want hospice, they want to be hospitalized. Uh, we try not to have that happen too often. So patients really need to get all your communication uh, needed to make sure that hospice care really is appropriate care for the patient at that point in their disease. So hospice is for prognosis of less than six months. Palliative care can be reduced with two or three years of life left over. The focus is on comfort care with hospice. It's a Medicare benefit. With palliative care, it may be combined with curative care. So patients can receive palliative care and chemotherapy or and radiation therapy or palliative care and a left ventricular assist device. It is independent of the payer. And of course, we have healthcare professionals such as myself involved with palliative care, and it is the fastest growing specialty in America and maybe worldwide. So we've gone over many of these first objectives, uh, a few words about advanced care planning. So what, what is advanced care planning? It is planning for future medical care. And the reason we need to do this is because most of us lose the capacity to make decisions before we die. 
if we have advanced dementia, like my mother has, we might lose the capacity to make decisions three, four, five years before we die. If you have cancer, you are more likely to lose capacity to make decisions within hours or days of dying. Either way, it is important to appoint somebody you trust to make decisions that are in keeping with your values, your principles. It cannot be or should not be a decision that they make because they cannot imagine life without you. If you would not, not want to live on a ventilator, that person should never say put him or her on a ventilator. So make sure you appoint the right person to be your healthcare agent. If you don't do that, then we're left with surrogate decision making and there's a hierarchy of surrogate decision making in every state, which is pretty similar. I believe I have a slide on that. If not, I'll, I'll give you the list in just a minute. So it should be updated according to any changes in your status, health status, or any changes you make with regard to what's important to you. Values and goals are explored and documented. You designate a surrogate decision maker or healthcare agent. In some states, you call a power of attorney for healthcare. It's a process, not an event, because it could change and reduces confusion and conflict when a patient comes into the hospital. And, and by the way, we have had many instances of a patient saying, I don't want to have a resuscitation attempt. I never want to be on life support. And we have a documentation in our medical record system. The patient actually stated that a form was completed and the wife was actually there. Then the patient comes into the emergency room four, four months later. This was an actual case that happened last year. And the patient loses capacity and the wife says, put him on a ventilator. Even though the provider can see in our EPIC system that the patient never wanted to have uh, a ventilator. So that doctor in the emergency room actually put the patient on a ventilator because he had an upset wife who was crying rather than listening to what the patient said by virtue of a well-documented family discussion. That was inappropriate. The wife needed to be supported. And that doctor should have said, ethically and legally, I'm not allowed to put your husband on a ventilator. We need to keep him comfortable. We need to honor his wishes. So these are instruments used in advanced care planning. A living will can be vague because it says, if I have a terminal illness, I never want so-and-so. But what if you have two doctors disagreeing as to whether the illness is terminal? You can have a verbal statement, a personal letter or value statement, a most or post I'll show you that's a medical order for life-saving treatment or a physician order for life-saving treatment. And now over 40 states in America, because each state has its own laws uh, that are followed. And so, uh, every state uh, or nearly every state now, more than 40 out of 50, have a form that is portable. So hospital, out of hospital, in a nursing home, the patient has given his or her directives that must be followed. And so this is an example of a healthcare proxy in New York. I so-and-so hereby appoint the name. If that person's not available, I point an alternate. Uh, the patient might state, I don't want CPR, I want CPR, or I only want it in such and such a state or scenario. And then page two is uh, the patient signs. We put the patient's name and address and then two adult witnesses. You don't need a notary public for this form. Notary public is somebody who has had some minimal training in stamping forms to, to designate that they were present and this was actually the patient who signed with witnesses. This is what a most or post looks like. This is a medical order for life-saving treatment. If a patient says, I never want to have resuscitation or I don't want a ventilator, this is the form we complete. Uh, it is now electronic so that actually we can put it in the New York State computer. And anytime that patient shows up in an emergency room in New York State, a doctor can find it even if the patient or family member didn't bring this form with them. And we tell patients to keep it on their refrigerator in case emergency medical technicians have a call to the home so that nobody has to search through 100 pieces of white paper to find the appropriate form that informs EMS that that patient does not want to have a resuscitation attempt, just to give you an example. So page one would be the patient wants CPR or DNR, but CPR is actually the default, so there's really no reason to do a, a most if the patient wants aggressive care. But if there's a limit to what the patient wants, then you would fill out this form. Page one is CPR or DNR. Page two would include ever trying a ventilator or having a feeding tube or getting or going back to the hospital or getting intravenous antibiotics or, um, or getting intravenous fluid. So 
why wouldn't a patient complete some advanced directives? Well, many patients believe that physicians should start these discussions, and in all honesty, most primary doctors, the vast majority, never bring this up, even with patients who have advanced disease, which is negligence on the part of the doctors. But I should say that doctors my age, in their 60s, had very little training. The doctors now are getting training in having these discussions. Procrastination, apathy, belief that a family should bring it up or that the family, you would upset the family or patient if you brought it up. But I can tell you most patients respond very favorably. Rather than talking about, let's talk about you're dying, what I say is, it's important that we honor and respect your wishes with regard to your care. We want to make sure, I want to make sure, that I don't provide you with any treatment that you wouldn't want. So let's talk about who you are and what's important to you. And then I will tell you what your medical status is and the prognosis and what the most likely outcomes would be of any intervention, whether it's resuscitation or, into, or intubation or chemotherapy. And then together, this is called shared decision-making, we agree on what is important to you and what the order should be. So these are physician barriers to advance care planning discussions, the belief that patients should start the discussions, that their discomfort with the topic, which I can tell you is real, time constraints, which has become worse over time as we spend more time in front of computers and less time actually finding out who that human being is across the desk or in the bed, lack of knowledge about advanced directives, and a negative attitude about the whole deal. So lastly, I want to talk about some selected ethical issues before we take a short break and then also have time for questions. Uh, some ethical topics in palliative care. I know you've had some talks in ethics and many of you have had some training in ethics. All treatment decisions are made in the context of person's values, diagnosis, prognosis, the risks and benefits of any treatment options, as I mentioned, like CPR, dialysis, use of mechanical ventilation, transfusions, antibiotics, and so on. Withholding or withdrawing a treatment is based on the same ethical principle of beneficence, doing good, and consideration of the risks and benefits. The double effect uh, is actually a principle that is three, 400 years old. Um, and what it stands for is what the intent is. So for example, a non-medical scenario would be that a train is heading down a track and there is a busload full of kids going to school and the train is gonna hit that bus. Unless you swish the track and divert the train to another track where there's a 90 year old person standing on the track or fell down over the track. If you divert that train, that older person will die. If you don't divert that train, a busload of children will die. Your intent is not to kill that older person. That is a result of your deciding very quickly that from an ethical standpoint, you are doing greater good and less harm by allowing one older person to die than allowing a busload of 30 kids to die. Same goes for treatment. If I give morphine to treat shortness of breath, my intent is to treat the shortness of breath. The morphine actually usually won't hasten the patient's death in the setting of a terminal illness usually the difference may be negligible or it might maybe the patient will die sooner by minutes or hours but my intent is not to kill the patient my intent is for the patient to have less suffering principle-based ethics autonomy is respect for self-determination beneficence is promoting well-being and doing good non-maleficence is doing no harm or reducing harm and justice is protecting vulnerable populations and providing for fair allocation of resources an example might be, I have one ventilator, I have two people, one is rich, one is poor. Justice means you do not give the richer person the ventilator over the poorer person. And likewise, race should not enter into it. Now, the limits of this simplistic principle-based approach, principles vary in importance between individuals. 
principles often conflict with one another. So you might be doing good in one way, for example, well, let's say, I'll give you an example, uh, self-determination. A patient is very depressed about a diagnosis of cancer. He's 25 years old, but that cancer is actually curable. And the patient says, I want to die right now. I don't want to go on life support. Now, if that patient potentially has acute depression that is treatable, do you listen to that patient, which means patient autonomy, self-determination, patients have a right to refuse treatment? Or are you doing harm by listening to that patient without even attempting to treat the depression and providing the patient with information that this, is, this cancer is actually curable? That would be an example of competing ethical principles of, of, of autonomy versus beneficence, non-maleficence. So the weight and meaning of principles may vary between cultures and individuals, and the process of getting clear direction and closure from a principle discussion sometimes is unclear. This is another way of looking at ethics cases, maybe a little more complex. What are the medical indications to, uh, for interventions, going on life support, getting dialysis, getting, giving chemotherapy? Let's say the patient has renal failure uh, and uh, dialysis is the issue, or the patient has cancer and chemotherapy is the issue. What if the patient now has lost functional status? So the patient's bedridden, where there's no study that ever showed that bedridden patients, unless they, they have leukemia, that bedridden patients with solid cancers benefit from chemotherapy. And the patient's insisting on chemotherapy. Are you obliged to give chemotherapy? The answer is no. If chemotherapy has never been shown to help the patient, even if the patient is asking for it, patient autonomy does not mean that you provide treatment that actually is more likely to hurt the patient. So there's no medical indication of chemotherapy. So patient preferences, I just mentioned what the patient's preference might be in two different scenarios. But you have to take in consideration what the medical indications are and what the outcomes would be of their preference. What is the quality of life? That's very subjective. I already mentioned that patients have different standards for what quality of life they would find acceptable. So in this case, we want to find out what the patient's quality of life was before they came in the office or before they came into the hospital and what the most likely quality of life would be with an intervention and then take into consideration the patient's preference. Contextual features identifies familial, social, institutional, financial, and legal settings. Ethical topics in palliative care include this issue of medical futility, which is not a word we ever use with patients or families because futility really means useless. Futilis actually comes from the Greek word of a vessel which would not hold water. So it had a large spout and you could pour in the water and the spout gets narrower so you can have the water go into a jug or a flask, but that futilis vessel is useless for holding water. So we never use the word futility with patients. We might use it with each other, and it means that a treatment will not fulfill a goal. So that a patient has severe acidosis, no blood pressure. If I attempted resuscitation in that setting of acid acidosis, no blood pressure, where even if I got the heart back, it would stop because you have no blood pressure, you don't have blood flow to the coronary arteries. So even if I got the heart back electrically for a minute, it's going to stop because the heart can't work with too much acid in the bloodstream, for example. So CPR, resuscitation, would be futile or non-beneficial. So don't use the word futility, but understand that it is used in medicine. So uh, non-beneficial care is the kind of term we would use instead of futile. Although, and now actually the Cures Act was passed in America so that we used to say futile in the chart and we wouldn't use the word futile in a conversation with a patient's family. But the Cures Act includes the, uh, so now families have open access to charts. So now we avoid writing the word futile and we will use words like non-beneficial care and explain what that means, meaning that the intervention will not succeed in achieving the goal of survival or being able to walk or being able to talk or whatever the patient's quality of life standard would be. So non-beneficial care is based upon understanding the context of this person's illness in, 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 with experience and values taken into consideration. And it's based on knowledge of the diagnosis, prognosis, risks and benefits. And we use the ethical principle of justice as part of the decision.
other ethical issues in palliative care include physicians, nurses, patients, families, all being engaged in decision-making. Patients and families provide the context of values, preferences, and functional status before they got sick. The physicians and nurses provide the medical information, which includes what the likely outcome would be of any intervention. And then the shared decision-making model states that with the medical information, patients then make a decision, but we don't offer things that don't help. Nurse and physician issues can lead to dissatisfaction. A nurse is there 12 hours, for example, a physician might just go in and out for a few minutes. So nurses might be more sensitive to patients and families issues with, and emotional issues. And they may feel like the patient is not as involved as they should be in the treatment decisions or maybe even that the patient's too involved in that they are, the physicians agreeing to things that will not benefit the patient. There are concerns regarding overly uh, burdensome treatments and interventions, and that can lead to moral distress when we're just treating aggressively and everyone knows the outcome is death. And there may be disagreements over withholding and withdrawing treatments. Um, nurses and volunteer issues may occur with communication, kind of confidentiality, which is uh, significant in the United States so that uh, we cannot give information to families without the patient's consent, um, among other things. And the patient might appoint one person to get that information. And so other family members are coming in and we're not allowed to get that information. So I know 30 years ago when I started practicing, anyone who's interested, we basically assume that they had the patient's best interest at heart and we would share that information. That's no longer the case. There may be conflict of interest or compromised care. So uh, there are multiple issues with regard to communication, and that's one of our skills is improving communication, facilitating communication between staff and family, uh, between patient and patient or family, physician and patient family, physician and nurses, physician and physician, language barriers, and adequate discussions with regard to treatment. And we hear all the time when we ask the patient, what did your doctor tell you? What do you know? Uh, more often than not, or too often, I should say, we hear that they didn't really get the information they needed. Emerging ethical issues or resource allocation. That became a significant issue during COVID, which I'll speak about later. Staff allocation, lack of time for quality communication, the level of care, withholding, withdrawing treatments. Competencies in palliative care include communication skills, understanding of euthanasia, which is providing a medication that leads to death intentionally, or palliative sedation, which is when you sedate a patient to relieve symptoms and the patient might die sooner, again, the double effect. Cultural, cultural and religious issues we must be aware of. Power issues, including on the part of hospital leadership or society, pain and symptom management, and the balance of patient choices and family needs and choices. So some selected legal issues in end of life care, can or should palliative care be mandated? And we have mandated it in our hospital, for example. And with leadership supporting us, we now have triggers for palliative care consultation in the emergency room, in the, in the ICU, on the wards. And we have a list of triggers. This is when you should have called palliative care. And that might include complex goals of care. Whereas we have trained all the primary care providers to have at least an initial goals of care discussion with the patient and family. Uh, pain and symptom management, especially in cancer patients. Uh, family support would be the main triggers for palliative care consultation or somebody who came in on hospice or if hospice is in the discussion. Determining capacity on the part of the patient. Somebody with mild dementia still might have capacity to appoint a health care agent, for example, even if they can't remember something that happened five minutes ago. Withholding, withdrawing life support. The use of artificial nutrition, hydration and then physician-assisted dying or euthanasia. And euthanasia is legal in at least two countries in Europe, including uh, Holland and uh, Brussels, Switzerland. Um, so in New York state, again, every state has its own healthcare law. Uh, the the Pot of Care Information Act was passed in, uh, about 10 years ago. It requires healthcare practitioners caring for a patient with a terminal illness to offer information and counseling to a patient or surrogate on available options for palliative and end-of-life care. I must say that even though this law has been on the books for 10 years, and I check frequently 
hundreds of doctors are violating this law every day. Not one doctor has been prosecuted for it. Determining capacity. Capacity to make decisions is specific for the decision. So as I mentioned, you can have mild dementia and not remember what you did five minutes ago or not remember where you put your phone or your keys. And yet you still might have, could very well have the capacity to appoint your son, daughter, wife, husband, cousin, who's a doctor uh, or nurse to be your healthcare agent. It is not global. So how do you determine capacity? Well, the patient must understand the risks, benefits, and alternatives of treatment options, meaning that when you have a discussion about these, the patient understands. The patient must be able to deliberate, think about the decision, and evaluate in accordance with his or her personal values. The patient must also communicate his or her choice. Of course, you reassess for each decision. So a complicated decision like whether to have surgery is very different than a simpler decision like who, is, who should be your health care agent? Who do you trust to make decisions for you? Should you lose the capacity to make decisions or for a more complicated decision? Or patients can defer at any time. I'm too nervous uh, to make any decisions. I want this person making it for me. So give that person all the information. I don't have to get it. Um, in fact, we just, a patient just told us today, she wants to receive all the information unless it's really bad. If it's really bad, don't tell her tell her daughter just this morning. That was the directive of the patient. And in fact, we are communicating that to the entire team and the patient happens to be on the surgical service. So capacity is different from competency, which in America is really a legal definition for someone to be able to manage their own financial affairs. The Family Health Care Decisions Act states that in the absence, again, this is New York State, in the absence of a healthcare proxy, it permits the surrogate to make healthcare decisions based on the patient's known wishes, or if not known, in the patient's best interest. The hierarchy, which I mentioned before, is if there's a legal guardian, that person takes precedence. Legal guardians are usually only present when the patient is developmentally disabled. Um, next is the spouse or domestic partner. After that, it's the adult child. After that, it would be the parent. After that, it would be a sibling. After that would be a relative or close friend who steps forward and says, I know what this patient would want or I'm the best person. And if no one contests that, that we would actually write in the chart, this patient, this person is the most appropriate decision maker or a surrogate decision maker. We actually have a form, the surrogate decision maker form. If the patient doesn't have the healthcare proxy, which states the appoint, who the appointed agent is, we look through this hierarchy and we determine upon the patient's admission who that person is and put that person down as the decision maker. So in terms of limiting treatment at the end of life, all patients have rights, even if incapacitated. And I don't know if you uh, had any lectures about this, but back in the 70s, there were two young women, Nancy Cruz and um, Kathleen Quinlan, who were in vegetative states. The parents of both these women in their 20s, one was by accident, one was by an eating disorder, um, the parents of both these young women said they would now never want to live like this in a vegetative state. Please take them off life support. Please stop the artificial feeding. And of course, then the doctors and the hospital says, no, we can't do that. We can't stop these things. That's killing the patient. The Supreme Court came down ultimately in saying that patients have rights. Patients have a right to refuse treatment. If a patient lacks capacity, then they are surrogate decision maker can speak on their behalf, uh, on their behalf, and that is something we call substituted judgment, meaning that the patient can no longer speak, but the surrogate decision maker or healthcare agent is now telling the doctors what the patient would want. So the patients have a right to refuse any intervention. Withholding withdrawing is the same thing. So if you wouldn't start something, you could stop it. That is not equivalent to homicide or suicide is not killing a patient. If you stop life support, allow the natural disease to end the patient's life. And you don't have to involve a court. In fact, just uh, today, we have a 33 year old man who uh, used cocaine and had a cardiac arrest just last week. Uh, he had an initial CAT scan of the brain that showed some evidence of 
uh, what is called hypoxic encephalopathy or reduction in blood flow and reduction in oxygen to the brain led to some damage. We didn't know how severe it was at the time. The patient had a repeat CAT scan just two days ago. It was diffuse swelling of the brain, near herniation. Uh, the patient has lost cranial nerve reflexes, is not yet brain dead. And so this, for this 33-year-old man, we met with the sister and the parents uh, with an interpreter because the parents' uh, primary language was not English. And uh, we told the family that he would never wake up and in fact was uh, appeared to be progressing to brain death, which then now is even more strongly the case. And so live on New York, which is in New York State, the, the organ donor network is speaking to the family about donating his organs uh, before we stop life support. And that's actually happening as we speak so that the fellow in palliative care is, is meeting with the family or, or already met with the family at 12, 31 o'clock. So these are life sustaining treatments that we can either not start or stop or uh, resuscitation, intubating a patient, surgery, dialysis, blood transfusions. I have another patient today who's getting multiple blood transfusions every day because of bleeding of an intra-abdominal uh, cancer that they cannot operate on any longer. One option might be to do interventional radiology where you put a catheter up the groin and try and embolize the blood vessel so that it stops the bleeding. Although apparently the interventional radiology department already determined that it's not likely to be effective. And do you just continue pouring blood at this patient or do you stop and allow the patient to die? And the patient's awake and alert. My fellow met with this patient, I'm gonna meet with the patient at three o'clock. Uh, putting in pacemakers or actually turning off a pacemaker providing artificial nutrition, hydration, antibiotics, or even going back to the hospital are all potential interventions that can be discussed. Legally, there is no difference between withdrawal or withholding life-sustaining treatment. However, there are psychological, emotional, and even religious constraints that may exist for the family. States have different laws guiding care surrounding artificial nutrition, hydration. And, but I can tell you that if a patient is close to death, by continuing intravenous fluids, you might actually cause more suffering, water in the lungs, the water in the legs. Uh, protein levels are usually down because the patient's malnourished. So in general, we do not recommend if a patient's close to death, providing artificial nutrition hydration, even though that can be very emotional for a patient to think how could you let the patient starve to death or, or die of thirst, but that's not the case. Dying naturally, involves not eating and not drinking because we lose our appetite. It's not like we're hungry just before we die. And it's important for us to inform or educate patients and families, usually families at this point, because patients uh, lose their appetite and a dry death actually is accompanied by less suffering than a, a wet death. So we're not legally required to do everything. We're legally required to do everything that can help that the patient doesn't refuse. I already mentioned that withdrawing or withholding life support is not the same thing as killing the patient, although some doctors still feel that way. Uh, and uh, the use of opioids at the end of life or benzodiazepines to treat anxiety at the end of life to control symptoms is not equivalent to euthanasia. Going back to that case, I mentioned uh, with slide one, clinical issues included the patient or daughter wanted full aggressive treatment, but no tracheostomy. The medical indication is tracheostomy is clearly indicated for continued mechanical ventilation. If we took the patient off ventilator support, he would die. The patient will eventually develop major problems from oral intubation that I mentioned. The standard of care is clearly a tracheostomy, but he wouldn't want it. Full, of, full aggressive care is not the standard for untreatable metastatic cancer. The patient's prognosis is poor, so it is suspected that the patient will die within days, two weeks, no matter what we do. But more immediately, if we take him off the ventilator, which we don't feel comfortable doing if the daughter's against it. So what are the patient family preferences? The patient can no longer speak for himself. Patients clearly express wishes to avoid tracheostomy. It is not clear what he would want with this scenario because he probably didn't think of being in this state. The daughter is not formally named the healthcare agent or proxy, but is a logical surrogate decision maker. And the daughter appears to have the patient's best interests and values in mind. What are the palliative care issues? What can we do if we get called into a case like this? Well, the patient's sedated, so the patient's not suffering, and we can make sure the patient's not suffering. We look for suffering, grimacing, moaning, and so on. The patient's quality of life seems poor to the staff, 
but if we're leaving the suffering, we help and support the staff because they may have moral distress about continuing aggressive care when we know what the outcome is going to be death, no matter what. The daughter believes that the patient would make the trade-off of some suffering for continued life. And he was always a fighter, which is a term we hear very commonly. There's a strong consensus among the staff that recovery is impossible, that treatment is futile. The daughter believes that the patient could recover despite being told repeatedly that he could not. So the daughter is what we call unrealistic, but we wouldn't say that in the chart now since the daughter can read the chart. We would just say that the daughter believes the patient can recover. The daughter would never forgive herself if she allowed treatment to stop. So staff, so the ethical and legal dimensions include the following. Staff feel they are causing harm to the patient. This leads to moral distress. We support the staff. The daughter feels she's protecting and advocating for the patient. Scarce resource questions are very active among the staff, but I can tell you that absent COVID or a similar situation of some catastrophe, that we usually have an ICU bed for a patient like this. But we actually can also move the patient out of the ICU, provide ventilator support outside the ICU, even if that means that the monitoring will be less often. The patient has medical insurance coverage, so that's really not an issue, even if the hospital might be concerned about being reimbursed, but we don't allow, allow that to drive care. The reality check is the patient is alive and would have died if recommendations were followed. And there is no basis for going to court in the absence of public policy. So finally, the so-called resolution of the case, although not everyone or anyone is happy, uh, daughter was doing her best to advocate for the patient. Although avoiding a trait did not make sense medically, as long as you treat the suffering and he's gonna die, then you don't continue to recommend tracheostomy. Unilaterally stopping treatment based on futility or non-beneficial care was not an option. In 49 states, in Texas, it, it probably would be an option because they have laws, futility laws that state if a patient has advanced disease, that the doctors actually can just stop treatment over the family's objection. There are no legal or ethical basis. There is no legal or ethical basis for unilaterally overriding the daughter's decision. The team needed to do their best to provide continued ventilation through the current ED tube to try to prevent damage and prepare the daughter if and when predicted complications came to pass. And, and we on the palliative care team help support the staff. So before we move on to a uh, discussion of ethical issues with COVID, uh, any questions about what I said or anything else? I just was wondering about um, like your thoughts on physician assisted suicide, because I feel like that would come up in your line of work, but I'm not totally sure, like, because I think it's legal in New York, but I don't know, like, how, like, socially accepted it is, like, how common it is. Um, and then, like, in what cases, like, a patient would suggest it and it would actually be followed through with. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. So actually... Uh, it is not legal in New York yet. Um, I'm pretty sure there are nine states. New Jersey just passed a law a year ago or so. It might, it might have been in 2019. Uh, so it is legal in New Jersey. The first state it was legal in, and so you know, physician aid in dying uh, or medical aid in dying, MAID, M-I-I-D, uh, is legal. So euthanasia is not legal. Doctors in no states are able to provide uh, any, any medication directly. Uh, we can inject patients, uh, but uh, doctors can provide prescriptions that patients take themselves. Um, so it started out, Argonne was the first state, 97. New Jersey was one of the last states two years ago. I think Vermont was another state just in the last two years, not New York State. So how do I feel about it? I can tell you that 10 years ago, uh, the official stance of the palliative care organization, the American Association of Hospice and Palliative Medicine was that we did not, or palliative care organizations not support it, but the majority of the population actually do support medical aid in dying. And now, just in the last couple of years, the American Association of Hospice and Palliative Medicine has taken a neutral stance, not for, not against. You know, as far as doctor's comfort level, I can tell you that in palliative care, we've been trained to say we don't hasten death, which is true, we don't. Um, you know, unless there's a double effect, in which case the patient's terminal like within hours or days. And, uh, and then we're treating symptoms. So it, I've been saying that for 25 years, the palliative care doctor, we don't hasten death. I don't feel comfortable myself. I mean, I probably would for somebody with ALS, for example, who 
uh, who, because that's one of the more horrible deaths, not to be able to breathe, to be able to be aware and not be able to breathe because your breathing muscles just have totally failed. Um, so there are situations where I think I probably would feel comfortable providing a patient with a medication that he or she would take uh, on his or her own. Um, and I think most palliative care doctors feel similarly to me. Some are against being involved, but most are absolutely fine with law being passed and being made available to patients, but only with terminal illness. Whereas in Holland and Brussels, and this is much more controversial in the United States, most doctors in the United States are not, are not comfortable with this. Patients with intractable depression can receive euthanasia in at least two countries in Europe. Uh, you have to have a terminal disease and you have to be a, a resident of the state for at least like six months before you can avail yourself of the state law in the states you can have medical aid and die. Thank you, that makes sense. You're welcome. Uh, one more question. Uh, so with uh, uh, MOLST and uh, POLST, is it, is it uh, before you perform CPR or uh, some other treatment, you first check to see if this document, if, if, if the patient is uh, permits the use of uh, the life-saving treatment. But do, uh, if somebody, uh, if there's an emergency, somebody comes into the hospital with CPR, do you first check or do you first start with CPR and then and then you check and you see if you want to, and you see if you would continue with CPR? I mean, if a patient comes in the hospital and has a cardiac arrest, I can tell you the ED doctors wouldn't stop to look to see if there's a most uh, or a pulse. Uh, they would just do it. And, and, it, and yes, it's happened sometimes that they did it. Um, now, if it, there's no time, obviously you have to err on the side of doing it because the sooner you start, the more likely you will succeed. You can always take a patient off life support. But if you had time, if, if the patient was in for a day or two or six hours and you didn't check, that's negligence. Okay. Right. So let's move on and we'll have time for questions later. Uh, COVID. Obviously, it's on our minds, and I think you just uh, had you've had lectures on it and saw a film about it. So it, now, the COVID first hit the West. Obviously, it hit China first, but it first hit the West in Italy. Um, and I'll show you what the Italian group did. And this is March of 2020, a little more than a year ago. They made their own clinical ethics recommendations for the allocation of intensive care treatments because their hospitals were overrun. Their ICUs were overrun. They had more patients with breathing respiratory failure than they had ventilators. And they really didn't have a clear paradigm for how to manage this. So they came up with their own uh, resource limited ethical guidelines. And this was the so-called Italian perspective. Uh, this is in fine print and I actually have it in larger print but this these were the ethical recommendations by the Italian Society of Anesthesia, Analgesia, Resuscitation, and Intensive Care, or CRT. So this is, these are the issues they address, the allocation of ICU resources, that you should have clear admission and discharge criteria uh, that are local and adaptable, that you need to have triage principles and criteria based on survivability. But I can tell you in the United States, that can be problematic, and I'll show you how. Uh, that we should have advanced healthcare directives so that every patient before they get sick should tell their loved ones or their doctors what they would not want for themselves so that you don't put someone on life support who wouldn't want it. And I can tell you that most Italians and most Americans, the majority do not have clearly outlined directives, even as they get older or as they get sick. There should be transparency. Withholding and withdrawing decision should be by a non-treating committee created by the hospital for these circumstances. Palliative care must always be provided to reduce and prevent suffering. Of course, there are staff limitations. If you've got now COVID and you've got hundreds of patients, which our hospital had, who are suffering, how can one palliative care team made up of a handful of individuals care for all those people, which means that you need to promote palliative care principles throughout the hospital. The principle of, of a trial of ICU stay must be communicated both to the staff and to the patients and families. So if it's clear at a certain point that you tried the ventilator and it wasn't gonna work, you need to be able to stop the ventilator in order to be able to use it for someone who it might work for. Which means that you might 
have to be able to take the ventilator off somebody, even if the family is saying no, if that patient has zero chance of surviving or almost no chance of surviving, and you've got another patient who needs a ventilator who might have a 70% chance of surviving. And networking and family care is also important. Sharing medical expertise, which actually could include writing articles like this one, uh, and self-care for the individuals because you're seeing so much distress, so much suffering, and so much death in a short period of time. Not to mention which, now you're asked, being asked or you're asking individuals who don't provide intensive care, who might just take care of dermatologists or radiologists to actually be involved in the care of these patients. And that's not what they signed up for. And the impact, of course, of restricted visiting policies, visitation policies, which happened with COVID. And that was an opportunity for innovation, especially telemedicine. So in 2015, well before COVID, uh, there was a New York State Task Force on Life and the Law. And this was to prepare for an influenza ep epidemic. And every state was asked to come up with their own ventilator allocation guidelines. And they used SOFA or sequential organ failure assessment to determine who should get a ventilator or who shouldn't or who should be taken off a ventilator. So I'll show you what SOFA is in just a minute. But with a high SOFA score, score meaning basically they're not gonna survive, you don't uh, provide a ventilator to those patients. Red is when you have a SOFA score less than seven with, or single organ failure where they might survive and those patients you use ventilators as available. Yellow intermediate, they have a SOFA score between eight and 11 where they might have multi-organ failure and you use those ventilators as available, but not un un until you've given the, all the ventilators to the red group. The green group is, uh, are, they have no significant organ failure. They don't need ventilators, so automatically don't get it. So they don't get it if they don't need it. And the blue, they don't get it because they won't survive it. And the red and the green are prioritized accordingly. So this didn't work out great, I can tell you, because we never implemented uh, the, the guidelines or pandemic guidelines. Every hospital in New York City was afraid to do that because there'd be headlines saying hospital denying treatment and no, no hospital wanted to be the first one. So a SOFA, sequential organ failure assessment score for predicting the outcome in patients with severe sepsis and evidence of hyperperfusion or low blood flow state at the time of emergency department presentation. This doesn't work great for COVID because a lot of people developed more significant disease over days, not necessarily when they first came in. When patients first came in, they often were short of breath, and then they, end up on a, and then they ended up having single organ failure within hours, and only later would they develop multi-organ failure. So this, uh, COVID was not a great disease to use this, even though we end up using some variation of it. And this is what SOFA includes. It includes respiration, coagulation, uh, liver disease, cardiovascular disease, CNS, patients' alertness, awareness, and neurologic status. So they all make up the SOFA score. So the, the worse the disease in all of these organ systems, the higher the SOFA score. This is what happened in our hospital. So we have a hospital of around 600 beds. This is by day. In the begin, the first a day is March 2nd. You can see that we had you know, a couple of patients. And then at the peak, we're talking April 3rd, all 600 beds or 590 beds in our hospital were COVID patients. We normally have a medical in ICU of 17 beds. We had 130 patients, 200 patients in the ICU equivalent, 130 patients on a ventilators. So you can imagine you had staff issues. We had to import critical care doctors who were researchers in New York or, or from other states. We, they were granted emergency privileges. We had to use doctors who took, or radiologists to call families or pathologists to call families. Uh, and that wasn't their skill level. Uh, you can imagine how important it was to provide palliative care to this patient, patient population and the families. And so this is what happened in our hospital and all the hospitals across New York City, which was the epicenter in the United States in April, about a, you know two months or a month and a half after it hit Italy, same thing. Now this is, this is what happens per age, and you can see that the older you are, the more likely you're gonna die. So there's a 30% chance of death if you came into a hospital and you were over 75. So, but 
you cannot discriminate according to age because in the United States, we have a federal law, not state law, federal law that prevents age discrimination. So if you start, if you had, let's say we will not put 90 year olds on ventilators, but we'll put 30 year olds on ventilators, that is age discrimination. As crazy as it is, even though survivability is to a large degree based on age. Now, the metabolic index is the obesity. And you can see if you're morbidly obese, you're more likely to die. But you cannot discriminate on the basis of weight, even though you're more likely to die. So this brought up some ethical issues. If the allocation of life support should be to some degree on the basis of survivability, which makes sense ethically, doing the greatest good for the greatest number, this utilitarian ethics, why aren't you using the data you have to guide who should get life support if you reach a point where you run out of machines? As it turns out, we, had, we were up to 90% ventilator capacity, then we got another 50. So we never actually reached the point where we didn't have a ventilator for everyone who quote unquote needed it. We did run out of dialysis machines for patients who had kidney failure because that all too often accompanied COVID. So the ethical framework for decision-making during the COVID epidemic and hospice palliative care, patient autonomy, are we honoring patient and family dignity, rights, values, and preferences? Participation, how are stakeholders being involved in developing and implementing criteria processes? So I can tell you, I was on the committee for my hospital. So we had a ventilator allocation policy that we, or, or pandemic policy that we never invoked because we reached 90% of ventilator usage. We never actually cross that threshold. And, and we have to decide because you can't use 100% of the ventilators and wait for the next person to come in. You have to make a decision before that point. Beneficence and non-maleficence, doing good, not uh, causing harm. Utility, I mentioned before, how may we serve the greatest good for the greatest number? Liberty, what is the least restriction we can place on the patient's self-determination to achieve a legitimate goal? Or even the liberty of being able to see your loved ones? Well, we actually denied patients the right to see their loved ones except by iPad, which is something that we had to uh, get quickly for the patients. Efficiency, how are we minimizing the resources needed to maximize results? The duty to care, what is the reasonable expectation of healthcare professionals to place their own health at risk in order to not abandon a patient or family? What is the organizational responsibility? Supporting staff, providing proper equipment, advocating, for adequate support from a legislative and regulatory agencies. Conscientious objection under what circumstances and by what means may professionals decline to provide care and what is their responsibility? Justice and fairness, are we applying criteria equally and consistently? When is it discrimination? And when is survivability, when are survivability criteria appropriate? Once a present is <clears throat> established, will we be able to continue applying the same treatment to others? and transparency. Are we open and clear with patients, family, staff, and the public about the criteria we use? And I can tell you that that wasn't always the case in some hospitals. So uh, the Hastings Center, by the way, is just north of New York. I don't know if any of you were ever interested in actually truly uh, doing a, some kind of fellowship in ethics, but it is the foremost ethics center in the United States and maybe the world. an ethically sound framework for healthcare organizations, including duty of care that's foundational to healthcare. The duty requires fidelity to the patient. Non-abandonment is a basic ethical and legal obligation and principle. Relief of suffering and the respecting the rights and preferences of patients to the degree you can, not compromising the health of other patients and staff. Duty of care and its ramifications are the primary focus for clinical ethics through bedside clinical ethics, consultation services, institutional policy and ethics education and training for clinicians. And by the way, that is the tripartite uh, responsibility of an ethics committee that is overseeing ethics consultations, providing ethics education and support for the staff and overseeing policy, making sure that any hospital policy is ethical. The duty to promote moral equality of persons and equity in the distribution of risks and benefits to society I've already touched upon. So uh, you can see at the bottom of this slide with the red arrow, as you increase resource scarcity, 
what you must prioritize. So there's stuff, there's space, and there's staff. So in the beginning, when you have resources, you can serve resources, and then you have something available for everyone, but your reserve staff is needed. You can see as you run out of resources, as you run out of stuff, you have to triage protocols. You have triage protocols, you must activate them when necessary. We were hours or day away in our hospital. With regard to space, some areas are unsafe and you must move patients. Infrastructure might be destroyed by a hurricane, which happened here actually, just not too many years, years ago with Hurricane Sandy. And then we had to move patients out of the hospital onto other hospitals. We had to empty our hospital within a matter of days. And there was no power in our hospital. Lay volunteers must perform key aspects of care when you have staff resource limitations. So that there's, from an institutional standpoint, you, you have the duty to plan, the duty to safeguard, and the duty to guide. So CPR in the COVID era was a big issue. What if a patient's on life support and you know CPR won't work? And in, in New York State, we actually need to get consent from a family not to do something, resuscitation, even when we know it won't work. Although I can tell you that when I tell patients we've reached the point, families, we've reached the point that we know CPR will not be effective, nine plus out of 10 families nod their heads, they understand, and I tell them I'm entering an order, do not attempt resuscitation because you know it won't work because of the acidosis, low blood pressure, or because we can oxygenate the patient despite maximum ventilation. But in COVID, CPR is resource intensive, intensive and poses risks to clinicians. CPR and hospital rest has limited effectiveness. And that was proven in China, actually. Crisis standards of care, uh, we never actually invoked. We were a day away from invoking the crisis standard of care and ventilator allocations I mentioned. But in that crisis, we would have a line about not attempting CPR. Patient autonomy was respected to the extent possible with transparency. So the recommendations are by ethicists to acknowledge resource constraints when discussing goals of care and DNR status, to forego CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation in certain circumstances when there's true physiologic futility or per crisis standards, and to ensure the safety of personnel we justify selective constraints on resuscitation. This is the last slide in this part of the talk. If medicine takes aim at death prevention rather than health and relief of suffering, it regards every death as premature, as a failure of today's medicine, but avoidable by tomorrow's, then it is tacitly asserting that its true goal is bodily immortality. Physicians should try to keep their eyes on the main business of restoring and correcting what can be corrected and restored, always acknowledging that death will and must come, that health is a mortal good, and that as embodied beings, we are fragile, that, and, and our bodies must stop sooner or later, medicine or no medicine. All right, so that's the last slide here. Pot of care is guided by patient's goals. Advanced directives clarify patients' goals. All of you should be speaking to your older family members or sick family members about what's important to them. Setting clear goals guides the, the direction and plan of care and minimizes ethical conflicts. Hospice is a way of delivering palliative care at the end of life. And palliative care should be introduced early in the course of life-threatening illness and is compatible with curative care. Um, so I'll take a couple of questions and then we have, I think, just fewer than uh, just 20 minutes or so for the last part on global palliative care. Dr. Lowy, I uh, compiled a list of the questions that were in the chat, if you'd like me to share those. Please do, yes. All right. Um, going back to diagnosis to death timeline, how did institutions come to include bereavement? Um, so bereavement, uh, most palliative care teams provide bereavement care either by referring families to organizations, actually now most of it's by telemedicine or remotely, uh, but in the past it was all in person. So, uh, you know, many churches, synagogues, mosques have bereavement, um, hospices all provide bereavement. So if a patient dies on hospice, that hospice agency will provide bereavement care, is legally obliged to provide bereavement care for 13 months, which would include the one year anniversary. 
And actually many of our hospice agencies now have opened it up to patients, to families who have lost loved ones, even when they weren't on hospice. And chaplaincy usually runs bereavement programs. And so chaplaincy might be part of palliative care. And so they'll have, uh, for example, our sister organization Long Island has bereavement programs for staff who have lost families, for COVID uh, families, uh, for uh, cancer patients in the cancer center and so on. It would be helpful for a new kind of medical professional non physician to assist in MAID. Well, I think those patients must be seen by two independent doctors uh, to determine number one, is does the patient have a terminal illness? Number two, to determine that the patient has capacity uh, and the patient really truly understands and, the, and doesn't have some reversible uh, depression that might be treatable. Uh, I don't, I, so I think you really need medical professionals involved in this process um, for all those reasons. And in terms of the ethical dilemmas, you, ha you can have independent doctors who've never met the patient, didn't know the family, uh, don't know the doctors who were referring the, uh, the patients. Um, so every state that has made should have physicians that, that don't have ties or conflicts that might impair their ability to judge objectively. You mentioned, or I mentioned that uh, advise and prefer for patients to move from hospice back to hospital care. Oh, no, uh, patients always have the right to do that, but we don't want a patient bouncing back and forth. Oh yeah, I'll take, I'll take hospice care, but I wanna go back to the hospital. They go back to the hospital, I want aggressive care. And then they go back to home. No, I'll, I'll take hospice care. No, go back to the hospital. That really, most hospice patients should understand they have a terminal illness. Most hospice patients wanna die at home. Going back to the hospital for something treatable, let's say if they had cirrhosis, but then they had a GI bleed we can treat, that's fine. Um, but to keep on go bouncing back and forth goes against hospice philosophy. So hospices will not discharge patients from a hospice unless they abuse the system. So that it is okay to accept aggressive care if you're in hospice, but not abuse the system. Um, elaborating on the role of the ethics team. So many ethical issues that come up are end of life since palliative care doctors are trained or nurse practitioners are trained in ethics. Could I interrupt you? Um, sorry. Um, the reason I was asking is because I'm a physician in the UK and um, my interest is palliative care, but we don't have ethics uh, teams there. So um, we get embroiled in ethical issues, but I just wondered how, when you're trained in those issues, like where does the ethics team come in and what kind of circumstances? Sure. So Joint Commission certifies hospitals and they're the, the Joint Commission, which is a federal agency, mandates that every hospital must have an ethics committee. So it's interesting that you don't have that in the UK. Well, not clinical. Um, we don't. So some of the tertiary centres will have a clinical ethics team, like a bioethicist, like Great Ormond Street, for right. example. But in the DGH hospitals, we don't have that. So we will have an ethics committee, but we won't have a clinical ethicist who would come in and consult on a case. Interesting. Um, well, it's mandated here because there are ethical conflicts. And, you know, we, we have a hospital of almost 600 people and he only really gets a, one or two cases a week. So, but it's still, it's 100 cases a year. And there, you can have a committee where you have a beeper system. You can have uh, consultants that are paid, but you want to make sure there's no conflict of interest with the hospital. You know, you, you, because you want to be independent of the hospital to a certain degree, because if the hospital wants to save money, that could be an ethical issue. If they're denying care to someone who doesn't have money, for example. So you want to have someone who could look at that and speak to it. Um, and I'm sure those issues come up in the UK. And I know many of the greatest ethicists, bioethicists have come from the UK. Uh, so uh, you must have a way for every physician to, or obviously you don't need it, you know, the primary physician can't be the one to approve an ethics consult because the ethics issue might have to do with that primary doctor doing the wrong thing. So yeah. anything up an ethical issue. it was like withdrawal of care or where family members couldn't agree. And um, and as you've said, a lot of um, a lot of doctors are uncomfortable with these kind of issues 
anyway. So not just within palliative care, but within any specialty. Right. It could be fertility issues. Yeah. Uh, and that's an outpatient issue mostly. So there, there you, 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 one should have access to ethics, bioethics consultation. Um, and now it could be a committee that's not part of the hospital. You know, you could just have a regional ethics committee, for example. It, it doesn't, as long as you have access to it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be, uh, then, you know, who would bring up, you know, how could someone bring up an ethical issue by a doctor or a nurse or an, or an institution, for that matter? Um, just moving on, and we, we're, because we're limited in time, uh, suffering. So don't you think patients who are suffering are not in the right state of mind to ask to be killed? Well, that is part of the evaluation is determining what the state of mind is. And so speaking to family members who know what that person might have said a year ago, two years ago, actually can help in determining whether this patient who is asking to die or for euthanasia uh, is something that is in keeping with who they were. On the other hand, someone has a right to change their mind. Uh, we had a patient who had dementia who, and said, you know, dialysis is okay with me even if I have a limited quality of life. And the wife, uh, we felt, and the psychiatry consult felt that the patient had capacity to make decisions even with their mild to moderate dementia. He knew what he was saying. And the wife told us, this is not the person I married. Uh, but we had to go with our determination that this patient knew what he was saying and was okay now with the quality of life that 10 years ago, he told the wife, if I can't do the Times crossword puzzle, I don't wanna live. Well, he was actually okay living now, not being able to do the crossword puzzle. And, we, and patients have a right to change their mind as long as they know what they're doing, so to speak. So it's complicated. Uh, you have to be able to assess the state of mind and the patients uh, and, and to make sure that they don't have a reversible uh, compromise. Uh, last question, are there considering or providing chemotherapy of patients who would do not have physical health but mentally the patient's desperate for life-saving treatment, how would you balance physical pain with mental pain? Well, look, it, if chemotherapy, you know, all the, all the research on chemotherapy is on patients who walked into, now I'm not talking about leukemia patients, but with, with solid cancers, these are patients who walked into clinics. So you cannot apply that research to a patient who was bedridden, for example. Um, so if it wouldn't physically help the patient because you don't have research to back it up, then you're not obligated to provide it. And in fact, you shouldn't provide it from an ethical standpoint. All right, I think we need to move on to the last part. Um, so let me get there because I do want to talk about some global bioethics. So this is based on the global atlas of, of palliative care at the end of life. Um, I, many of these basics I really went into, so we don't have to get into what palliative care is. You already understand that. Um, this is the WHO definition of palliative care for children begins when illness is diagnosed and continues regardless of whether or not a child receives treatment directed at the disease. Health providers must evaluate and alleviate a child's physical, psychological, and social distress. Effective powder care requires a broad multidisciplinary approach that includes the family and makes use of available community resources, which is very limited in many countries. And it can be provided in tertiary care facilities, in community health centers, and in children's homes. So I, you know, palliative care really is a human rights issue as healthcare in general is. Uh, so as you can imagine, international organizations have stated that healthcare is a right of everyone in the world. In 2000, core obligations were outlined to include access to health facilities, goods and services on non-discriminatory basis and the provision of essential medicines as defined by WHO World Health Organization, the adoption and implementation of the health, of public health strategy. So basically they're saying every country should take care of your own, but the world itself has an obligation to help. So the richer countries should help the poorer countries. In the context of palliative care, all people with life-limiting illness should have access to basic medications for symptom control and terminal care. Palliative care should be part of national health care policy. And then they listed 14 medications that should be available in every country to everybody who's sick. Of course, this is not necessarily the case. So how do you determine how many people need palliative care the methodology used for estimating people in need at the end of life worldwide is based on a, upon a framework which considers mortality data from diseases 
requiring palliative care adjusted by the estimated pain prevalence or suffering index for each category of disease. So if a patient healthy is healthy and dies of pneumonia within three days, that person doesn't need palliative care. But the list of diseases here uh, that cause death across the world are diseases that patients should have palliative care for. And these are diseases, Alzheimer's or other dementias, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, excluding sudden death, cirrhosis of the liver, COPD, diabetes, HIV, AIDS, kidney failure, MS, severe Parkinson's, rheumatoid arthritis, and drug-resistant TB. These are diseases requiring palliative care for children, uh, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, but especially congenital abnormalities. And you'll see the prevalence of, of these diseases in just a minute. So this is the estimate of people need a palliative care at the end of life. Now, again, this is the end of life. There are many patients who need palliative care with years to live. So here, according to WHO, approximately 55 million uh, patients, great majority of deaths, 66% are due to non-communicable diseases. And so 66% of patients die across the world of non-communicable diseases, 25% of communicable diseases. Most, most of those do not need palliative care and most injuries do not need palliative care if they die in a car accident, for example. This is distribution of people in need of palliative care at the end of life by age group. And you can see, of course, most of most are adults who are older. Only 6% are children. And these are the regions of the world, regions of the Americas, North and South, the African region, Eastern Medita Mediterranean region, which includes uh, the Middle East, some of the Middle East, European region, Southeast Asia region, and the Western Pacific region. So these are the rates for children in, uh, in need of AIDS palliative care and you can see in red is the highest, by far it's in Africa. Next is Eastern, the uh, Eastern uh, Mediterranean and what most people would consider the Middle East. Uh, and then you have the Americas and Europe and Russia. Female, male, roughly equivalent, more males. So the estimated global number of adults need the palliative care at the end of life is 19 million. But across the world, not including end of life, is, is more like 50 million. And these are the diseases killing adults. You can see cancer, just like in America, cancer and cardiovascular disease at the bottom, between 34 and 39%. After that, COPD, HIV, AIDS, diabetes, kidney, and so on. These are, these are percentage of adults in need of palliative care. So the percentage of adults in the kind of care with HIV AIDS is very high. Cancer is about 30%. Cirrhosis of the liver, about 50%. Multiple cirrhosis, about 45%. Kidney disease is 30%. Rheumatoid arthritis, around 25%, and so on. And you, and you should have these slides available to you, so I don't have to go into these in detail. This is going by the WHO regions, you can see that the patients need a palliative care at the end of life, Europe, Southeast Asia, 22%, West Pacific, 29%, and then lower across the other regions. And these are the rates of adults that need a palliative care at the end of life by WHO region. So more people need palliative care in Europe because more people die more suddenly in other areas. This, these are the rates of adults in need of palliative care for HIV and gold. You can see that's much more common in Africa, in cancer in the light blue, and in progressive non-malignant diseases in the darker blue per region. Now, this is looking at income. Interestingly, if, you have, if you're upper middle income, you need more palliative care because you're more likely to die older, more frail of, of chronic diseases. If you're uh, and in lower middle income, more of those, or the poor, more of those people die more suddenly because they don't have access to good care that would probably cure them of curable diseases. And this is the distribution of diseases in children. Congenital diseases responsible for 25%. Protein, energy, malnutrition, again, poorer countries, 14%. Meningitis, those, a lot of these kids didn't get meningitis vaccines, 13%, HIV, AIDS, 10%. Of course, much more common in Africa. 
and this is the distribution of children in need of palliative care across the WHO regions. And you saw that more adults in Europe needed palliative care, but here more children need palliative care in Africa and Southeast Asia. And this is the rates of children need of palliative care at the end of life by WHO regions again, much more so in Africa. And Africa is very dependent on help from, so the Melinda and Bill Gates, even though they're getting divorced, their foundation has provided a significant amount of aid, the biggest uh, amount of aid from anywhere else outside of Africa to Africa. Um, and distribution of children in need of palliative care at the end of life by WHO region and disease category. Again, HIV AIDS is more common in, in Africa. Uh, and progressive non malignant diseases responsible for most of end of life and the need for palliative care across the other continents and regions. And the rates of children, you can see low income children need the most help and they're not necessarily getting it. So this is where palliative care exists. You can see the highest level is in green. That's North America and Australia and Europe. The next level is light green. You can see there are a couple of, <laughs> Uganda is like the lone country in Africa. And then there are a few countries in Africa and China have palliative care. And of course the brown to the red, there's very little palliative care. Getting into the situation, this is a worldwide ecological study of national context of countries that have and have not implemented palliative care. This is an ecological study of the national context of countries to identify relationships between potential predictor variables and the level of national palliative care development. There are six domains that they looked at, disease, demographics, socioeconomic issues, health systems, politics, demographics, and economics. So when looking at this, in more depth, they found out that palliative care is less developed in countries with weak democracies and high levels of political corruption, infant mortality rates, and deaths by infectious disease. Palliative care is more developed in countries with a high percentage of deaths from non clinical diseases, population proportion greater than 65 years, or gross national income and tourism. And development occurs, or development of palliative care occurs in response to increased longevity of need relative to other health concerns. There may be a societal tipping point where healthcare priorities switch from life extending therapies and the success of acute care provision may develop into delivery of expensive and futile treatments at the end of life, which is certainly something we've seen in richer countries. Uh, this is an article about distributive justice being an ethical priority in global palliative care. Of the 20 million people in need of palliative care at the end of life globally, only 10% receive it. Total need of palliative care is closer to 6 million people, including people who are not at the end of life who have chronic non-malignant diseases. And the estimate is that 60 more than 60% of all cancer deaths occur in low middle income countries. And then it, they, on this, in this article, I had a case presentation of a 36 year old HIV positive woman in Uganda, patient G, with stage three A cervical cancer. 85% of cases of cervical cancer occur in sub-Saharan Africa. She had access to and was compliant with her antiretroviral regimen in Uganda. Uganda actually has palliative care and they have HIV care. But it's even though it's an outlier in palliative care, it is not an outlier in Africa in terms of the treatment for cancer because radiation therapy for her cervical cancer was not available except by an eight hour bus ride to Nairobi, Kenya. And only if you were stage 2B or lower. And the only Uganda radiation machine broke down in 2016. So as of 2019, there was no radiation oncology in Uganda, even though there was HIV medication. Treatment with chemotherapy would have required cash, which this woman did not have. So the ethical principle of distributive justice underpins questioning of resource allocation. Healthcare in general and comprehensive cancer care should be a right but is not available in many countries. The WHO constitution advocates the achievement of the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right of every human being and encourages a human rights-based approach to health policy making both at a global and national level. Although antiretroviral uh, therapy is frequently available in Uganda to reduce costs, you can see from this case report that access to other forms of care is more limited and national health insurance is nominally available to patients, but access is limited 
by severe resource constraints and many medications and services necessitate out of pocket expense, which these patients do not have. Any discussion about the integration of palliative care principles and ethics reveals a fundamental tension between the theory of distributive justice and its actualization in low middle income countries. Palliative care should not be a, uh, a cost effective alternative to an unavailable cost directed or disease directed treatment. Investment in palliative care delivery should, should be accompanied by escalation of disease directed infrastructure development in Africa. And of course, that means the government's response for doing that. And what happens if a government spends more time on fighting neighbors for religious issues than in an infrastructure? Who are we in America or in the UN or in the uh, EU to tell a country what to do? And you already saw that if a country is corrupt, that has a corrupt political system, and how many countries don't have some corruption in their political system, what can an international association or organization do? In G's case, distributive justice lies in the hands of both our government and of the international community. Creating just care in the international healthcare environment requires examination of cultural norms, values, priorities, and expectations, along with the sense that we have an obligation to achieve them. The landscape of global health is quickly evolving as international healthcare systems and medical organizations are developing solutions to dilemmas that face the global village and planet as a whole. Despite admirable efforts by many governing bodies to unify globalized health improvement, Palliative care especially has often not been included as a priority for health research, education, practice, or policy. In summary, between 2011 and 2017, patients cared for by specialized palliative care providers, and by the way, this is research just came out last year, increased from three to seven million people, but more than 20 million people at the end of life, and more than 60 million people overall should have access to palliative care who need it and, and yet only 10% of people get it. 78% of adults and 98% of children need a palliative care are low to mid income, but highest rates are in the high income groups for adults. Non-communicable diseases represent 90% of the burden of life, cancer and progressive non-malignant diseases, cardiovascular disease, COPD and diabetes, except in Africa where HIV and AIDS contributes to 42% of the burden. And the majority of the world has isolated provision of palliative care or worse. So, this, these are the realms in which a difference can be made. One is policy, palliative care is being part of a national health care plan policy, funding and service delivery models support palliative care delivery. And of course, who are the policy makers, policy makers and regulators, WHO and non-government organizations, uh, which can be philanthropic. The, uh, of course, the Gates Foundation being the most prominent Medicine availability, having essential medicines availability, importation quotas, our barriers, costs, prescribing, distribution, dispensing. From an education standpoint, you have media and public advocacy, curricular courses like this one, which Analita has run now for years, expert training, family caregiver training and support, and then, then implementation on the ground, opinion leaders, trainer manpower, strategic, strategic and business plans, are necessary in standards and guideline measures. Uh, so last slide, uh, we have about uh, five minutes for questions. I had one, Dr. Lowy, if you don't mind. Oh, go ahead. I wondered from a funding standpoint, um, sometimes if you have a, a donor, for example, the Gates Foundation or something along those lines, they will specify um, where they'd like to see their funds directed to. If you, I, I see that you mentioned that you need to address the, the actual illness at hand first prior to just defaulting to, you know, there's an absence of treatment for this particular illness, let's just provide palliative care. Is there sort of a, a ratio that you would recommend if someone wanted to say X number of dollars should go to, or X percentage should go to treatments and X percentage should go to palliative care? Because inevitably there will be some palliative care required um, along the way. So what, what would your suggestion be? Well, actually, it's interesting because I just presented to the chief medical officer of my hospital some data to support uh, additional staffing. So palliative care has been shown to increase patient satisfaction, increase uh, or improve pain and other symptom control, to save money, and there are national standards, uh, and, and Canada has its own national standards, I'm sure the UK does as well, of what kind of palliative care staffing you need in order to um, 
provide appropriate palliative care, which saves the hospital and the country money because now you're not providing uh, care that doesn't work and you're providing care that helps. Uh, and you're making sure that the treatment the patient uh, receives is aligned with the patient's goals and preferences. So if palliative care saves money, so we have standards both nationally and locally of how much staff you should have, doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplaincy, to provide palliative care for hospitals. So like per 25 patients, this is what you should have, or for an outpatient clinic, this is what you should have. So there are uh, national standards for that. And uh, that's what we use in order to go to administration or the institution uh, in order to justify palliative care staffing, and which would then give you the percentages you're asking for. Thank you. I have another question, if you don't mind. Um, just with regard to do not resuscitate forms. So um, I recently did the Canadian Bioethics Society conference and there was some discussion about um, MAID and different advanced directives and how the focus in Canada is much more on patient autonomy as opposed to more of a patriarchal in the best interests of the patient. Um, so in the UK, in the acute setting, if a patient came in in the night, very, very unwell, too unwell to have a conversation, you knew that resuscitation was going to be horrible and unsuccessful medically and there was nobody else to get hold of, then two doctors can then sign a do not resuscitate form to prevent that person from going through that horrible trauma. Mm -hmm. um, are you, so does that not happen in the States? Does it have to be? It, it happened with COVID um, to some degree, but it, uh, that's because, you know, for example, New York State governor said in the care of COVID patients, uh, doctors had less liability. So um, it happened to some degree during COVID, I know. But you know, without a pandemic situation, it does not legally happen in the United States, except in Texas, where two doctors can say, uh, you know, this patient has cancer, we don't need to do CPR. In 49, mm -hmm. other, in 49 other states, doctors cannot legally do that. Oh, sorry, yeah. that's made the wrong noise, but that's horrible. It is horrible. Yeah. Uh, that's because patient autonomy, you know, to some degree ran amok in the United States. I think it was great. No, and the thing is patient autonomy really came about in order to allow patients to refuse treatment. So, you know, those two young women I mentioned in the seventies were in vegetative states where the parents said they wouldn't want to live like this. Please take them off life support. The doctor said, no, no, we can't. So patient autonomy really came about to protect patients, to allow them to refuse treatment that doctors were trying to impose on them. Yeah. And what you're bringing up is a situation where doctors really should have the autonomy not to provide care that won't work and not to put patients through unnecessary uh, resuscitations or life support. Um, so I don't know at which point we'll be able to do that, but I think there's a fear that you want to give doctors too much power to authorize not doing something that a patient would want that might help them, even if you're talking about a situation where it really wouldn't help. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I hope, I hope there can be a balance. <laughs> yes. Striking the right balance is always a problem.